I'm going to start out with some uh, self-deprecating humor, uh, mainly by... This is my student ID from, from 1984 when I was at Peking University. Uh, and I just got on the plane and I looked like I'd been kidnapped. Uh, I was always interested in religion uh, as a grew up in a fairly religious household, and when I went to China, I was curious about the religious life of China. Of course, I you know, read uh, about the different faiths in China, and so when I was with my classmates at Peking University for fun, we'd get on our bicycle and ride from Peking University to different places around Beijing uh, to see what was left of me religious life in China. This is over in 1984, the Cultural Revolution had just ended eight years earlier. Uh, it wasn't ancient history like it is now. Um, and here's a picture of me, uh, more humor, uh, uh, at, at uh, the White Cloud Temple. Um, the White Cloud Temple is the ma is a major, or maybe the major Taoist temple uh, in China. And the main thing I think to, to notice here is how empty it is. Um, at that time, temples and, and religious sites in China were, A, there weren't that many of them, and B, they were pretty empty. And I, at the time, being a callow youth, uh, thought, well, this is typical uh, because, of course, the communists have been running China for 30 years, and they must have destroyed sort of all religious life. Uh, I had in my mind pictures like this uh, of uh, destruction from the Cultural Revolution, which uh, indeed wiped out a lot of religious life in China and, and pretty much forced all, or closed all open expression of religious life for 10 years from 1966 to 1976. So that included not just traditional faiths like Taoism and Buddhism and folk religion, but also Christianity and, and Islam. So pretty much all that was closed down at that time. But what I didn't realize, or what I came to realize a little bit later, was that this uh, turn against religion hadn't started in 1949, when the People's Republic was founded, but it actually started about 100 years before that. Um, and this was uh, a time in, in the 19th century after the Opium Wars when China was going through a uh, period of great self-doubt uh, and questioning about whether China could uh, survive as a, as a country. You know, the Chinese the people running China, the elites in China, not just people in government, but all kinds of educated people looked around the world, saw how the world was being carved up, uh, countries like India were colonized, and the question really was, who China be next? Uh, and so they began to doubt their own culture, their own faiths, uh, and this sort of culminated in a radical turn against all domestic faiths in China, uh, especially, uh, and so in other words, Taoism and Buddhism. Uh, and you may wonder why, but I think this is because as in all traditional societies, even if you think of, say, Europe as well, uh, in, in earlier times, religion and politics were intertwined, were inseparable. And so when people were trying to change the political system or save their country, uh, they thought that part of the problem was their own uh, political system, but that also included religion. Um, and this isn't maybe quite as unusual as it seems. In many countries around the world, many civilizations had similar Many people had many had similar thoughts in the wake of World War I when the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Uh, Adam Turk pushed through a radical, top down, secularizing vision of Turkey. Um, some mosques were even converted to museums. Men were not allowed to have beards, people only had mustaches. Women weren't allowed to really wear the hijab. Um, and so, likewise in China, there was a turn against especially traditional faiths. Um, and we can see this in the, in the late 19th century, the great reformer, Kang Yo Wei, uh, proposed converting temples into schools. 
the idea that we don't well, we don't need more of these temples, we need schools, we need an educated workforce, literate, scientifically literate, that can uh, take on the West. Um, the person often credited with overthrowing the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, Sun Yat-sen, when he was setting off as a young revolutionary, he went to the temple in his local town in Guangdong province and smashed the statue of the local Taoist deity. Basically, they to get rid of all of this uh, stuff that's holding us back. And much Chinese religious life at that time was defined as superstitious, uh, self-defined as superstitious. So this idea, religion and superstition, was these were two concepts imported into China uh, in the 19th century from the West via Japan, which you had a similar, uh, gone through a similar process when they were you know, modernizing in the wake of Meiji, in the wake of the Meiji Restoration. Um, the terms themselves, religion in Chinese, zongjiao, and superstition, nishin, are neologisms uh, that were directly taken from, uh, from Japan. So, of course, religion existed in China before, but people didn't have this idea of religion as we think nowadays in the, in the modern society as something that happens at a certain time of the week, in a certain place, in a certain discrete part of society. Instead, much religious practice was intertwined with, in daily life. So these concepts began to be brought in, um, and again, people realized, well, these supposedly successful Western countries that are uh, uh, taking us to the cleaners, uh, they have religion, so some religion must be okay. And the religion that was defined the norm for religion, for acceptable religion, was Christianity. Uh, Christianity uh, had you know, a, a, a place of worship, church, certain times of the day, of, of the week maybe, or the day, a professional clergy, uh, a holy scripture, all of these were considered to be marks of acceptable religion, and other things were then thought of as superstition. So things like, say, fortune telling, or worshiping uh, deified historical uh, personalities, um, holy mountains, these were widely seen as uh, superstitious. Uh, and this is uh, a good example of this was after the Qing Dynasty fell, the Republic of China. So under the Guomindang, the KMT, Chiang Kai-shek. So again, we're still pre-1949, uh, passed a law that was to define which temples in China should be torn down and which temples should be preserved. And so they were actually gonna go through all the temples in China and so they decide superstitious or acceptable, superstitious or acceptable. And by and large, most of the temples were seen as superstitious. So all the little temples to earth gods that you find, if you went to a Chinese village a uh, hundred years ago, you would find at least one temple in every village, if not two, three, four, five temples to different deities. Um, and by and large, these things were all eradicated. Um, I say all sounds excessive, but by the middle of the 20th century, and this is a guesstimate, but it's a fairly reliable estimate. Half of the temples that had existed in a survey at the end of the 19th century had been destroyed or repurposed, often converted into schools. And in fact, in China today, many of the most famous schools in China, elementary schools and high schools, are built on the site of temples. Uh, now, obviously, since then, there have been many, many more schools that have been built. But if you look at the most famous ones, the oldest schools in Chinese big cities, it's often like that. Um, what about uh, Christianity and Islam during this period? Islam has always been defined in China as an ethnically based religion that's confined to 10, in, in today's China, to 10 ethnic groups, primarily two big ones. Uh, that have mostly been on the periphery of China, although you do find some of them in the heartland of China as well. But they didn't, they weren't seen as having to do with ethnic Chinese, Han Chinese people. So they were defined as, a, as an ethnic, ethnic religion. Um, and mainly in areas that had been relatively recently conquered by the last dynasty of China, the Qing dynasty. 
Um, Christianity had obviously come in earlier. We know Christianity has long roots in China um, and has had a permanent presence in China for over 400 years. But Christianity played a fairly small role in terms of overall numbers of Christians. Um, and there was, uh, in fact, a, a, a famous paper that was written in the 1920s uh, questioning why did Christianity fail? Why did the church fail, especially the Catholic, why did the church fail to convert people? Because there were so few uh, converts up until, uh, at that time, in the 1920s. Uh, Christianity's main role was, again, it had this defining function, function of what was a real religion as opposed to what was superstitious. Um, but the role of Christians was, was disproportionate. If you think the first president of the Republic of China, Sun Yat-sen, he had converted to Christianity. His successor, Chiang Kai-shek, had also converted to Christianity, both through, the, through their wives. Um, the first parliament in China had roughly 25 to 30 uh, percent Christians in the parliament, a very highly disproportionate number, considering that less than one percent of China at that time was Christian. But um, China at that time, so Christianity has had a pretty small role. Um, when the communists then take over in 1949, they don't follow, in essence, radically different policies. They follow roughly the same policy as their predecessors, the KMT, which is to define acceptable religions. And so just like the KMT, they find five religions as being acceptable. This would be Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, and then for administrative purposes in China, Christianity is split into two religions, Protestantism and Catholicism. You might also, some people might ask, what about Confucianism? Some people often think, was, is Confucianism a religion? This is sort of a point of debate among people. Um, Confucianism was proposed in the 1920s to be China's national religion. So again, this reformer, Kang Ye Wei, proposed converting temples and schools. He recognized that all successful countries have a kind of national religion, that religion plays a role. And just like Japan had created Shintoism out of uh, different folk practices. He also thought China should maybe adopt Confucianism as a national religion. But this didn't go anywhere, I think, because Confucianism was too tightly bound up with the old imperial system of the emperor. So Confucianism was jettisoned and never recovered its status uh, as a area, of, uh, as, as a system of faith, but became sort of redefined as just a philosophy. Even though, if you go to big Chinese cities, you'll find Confucian temples. Like in Beijing, there's a, a giant Confucian temple. These fellows in all big Chinese cities. Um, so the communists uh, define these five religions, and all the five religions have associations that are supposed to manage these religions. So it's sort of a neat flowchart. You have the government, and you have the Religious Affairs Bureau, and underneath there are five associations. And, very neatly, they're supposed to run all of these five religions. Um, and this existed for a few years until, um, as the party later said, it, the country veered off into leftist excesses. Um, so Mao's Great Leap Forward and then uh, various cleanup campaigns were often target, also targeted religious life especially in the Cultural Revolution, which brings us back to this image. So this process of hostility toward religion, this uh, predates the communists, but probably reaches its apogee under the communists because they were a very strong, centralized, Leninist, one-party state that could push through this brutal, modernist vision of how, of what a modern country should be, industrialized, uh, with very little religious life and what religious life exists should be tightly controlled, etc. Um, the problem uh, then is, of course, uh, after 30 years of, 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 of this Mao dies, in the 1970s, the party has to do a giant reset. Um, we know this is at the beginning of the reform period in China uh, under Deng Xiaoping, starting in 1978 when he uh, assumes power, uh, and the party then tries to go back to the early 1950s, and they issue 
a fantastic uh, document, which is well worth reading, you find on the internet, called Document 19, uh, written in classic, optimistic, uh, communist language. It says, we of course realize that religion will die out as we progress from socialism to communism. It's an iron law that will die out. Um, but what we did in the past was a little too violent, was a little too hasty, so we're going to reopen churches, mosques, and temples um, with the ex and then seminaries and allow new priests and imams and, uh, and so on to uh, be trained. But this is just going to be a temporary situation until naturally, as we progress forward, this dies out. Well, what happened is that China then went through a period of great religious growth starting in the 1980s um, through the 90s, 2000s. Uh, and so we get to sort of this period, which I think is neat to contrast this photo with the first photo that I showed of White Club Temple, which was empty except for that dorky looking foreign student who was standing in front of the incense burner. This temple is full of people, and this is not an uncommon sight in Chinese temples. Um, and you have also a very uh, well-dressed person with an authentic Gucci, <laughs> Gucci, is it Gucci, right? Gucci bag, um, and uh, piously uh, with her insides and about to pray. Uh, and this is quite common now in China, not just temples, but also churches and mosques being uh, well, uh, well, visited and, and full. Um, so I had some other pictures of religious life, but I'm going to just kind of flip through them. And uh, these were taken by a photographer, uh, a professional photographer, so I should look good. And so this. This religious revival continues. I'll just leave these for a couple more. They'll auto circulate just through. Um, this, pe this period, 80s, 90s, 2000s, even though we're probably all aware, if you've been following religion in China at all or following the church, you're well aware that in this period there were crackdowns, there were a lot of challenges and problems. But compared to the past 10 years, at least, I would say this is a relative period of laissez faire. Uh, toward religion. Uh, that religious life in general took off in this period. Um, there were specific challenges, especially for the uh, for Christianity, where many Christians, both Protestant and Catholic, were not satisfied with the government-run churches, and you have huge up, uh, rising up of the underground churches to the point where now where I'd say roughly half of both Catholics and Protestants worship in underground churches. Uh, and a little bit more about that later. But overall, I think it's just worth emphasizing that the 80s, 90s, 2000s was a period when many different social aspects in China uh, took off. There were more uh, social organizations of all kinds, charities, even some nascent NGO movement in China, environmental movements. Um, not always with the government blessing. I mean, the government didn't want religious life to take off, but because it sort of was weaker at the, at the end of the Cultural Revolution and felt that it had to make a new pact with society, there was more room for people to operate and to set up churches and stuff like that. Um, now, I think the real focus of what I'd like to talk about is the situation over the past decade or so. Uh, the new role of the state in China. Um, so we had this period of, just to sort of recap, from intense hostility toward religion, going through much of the 20th century, uh, to this period of sort of relative benign neglect in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, to a period today where the state is much more actively trying to manage religious life. Um, and this, I don't want to say that everything starts with Xi Jinping, I think it's simplistic. I think there's a general feeling, even before Xi Jinping took over, that many of these organizations were not firmly enough under government control. That includes NGOs, it includes the internet, um, it includes, uh, but it also includes religious life. 
Uh, she, though, recognizes uh, recognized uh, that there was a spiritual vacuum and a, a searching for values in China that I think came up in this period of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, along with the economic growth, or maybe because of the economic growth. This period of rampant hyper capitalism, I think, helped create among many people uh, a search for values and faith of some sort. So this helped drive people toward religion. I think she's view is that the state had, has to be much more active. I hate to use the word proactive, but proactive in, uh, in uh, guiding and controlling this search. So she, one of his first acts after taking office, this is, um, I think, like a week after taking office, takes a whole Politburo to the National Museum, so it announces China Dream, um, the dream of uh, you know, a new revived China with more faith in society. Um, also, shortly after taking power, he makes a visit to Confucius's birthplace. This is a scene of him next to the party secretary. It looks like he's having a heart attack, um, reading the books of, looking, browsing through the books of Confucius, and saying some nice things about Confucius that I can learn a lot from this guy, or something like that. Um, he also begins to court, or at least um, uh, in, in a way that I don't think we've really seen too much before, other leaders, like Buddhist leaders. For example, here he is meeting a very famous Taiwanese abbot, Xin Yun, of a Buddhist missionary, uh, missionizing organization called Fo Guang Shan. Uh, and so Fo Guang Shan has uh, temples all around the world, probably also in Chicago. Um, I don't know check this time, but they're all over the place. He's trying to spread uh, Buddhism. And they were then welcomed back to do work on the mainland. Um, she actually, around the same time, made a speech at UNESCO, the UNESCO headquarters in Paris, and said that, uh, yes, Buddhism was founded in a foreign country, uh, but it was 2,000 years ago, and since then it's indigenized and become a part of Chinese society. Uh, so he spoke very specifically. And of course, Taoism is Chinese indigenous religion. Folk religion is also a kind of indigenous religion. Uh, so he spoke nicely about these faiths. Um, I'll get more concretely into that in a minute. Um, and actually, I met Xin Yun, uh, and he told me all about meeting Xi Jinping and how Xi Jinping was flattering for him and so on and so forth. Um, the government began to push uh, also a campaign of traditional values in a way that we haven't really seen before. Um, why did it do that? I think because the communist method of instilling morality was this vacant, hollow, model workers, model heroes like this guy, uh, Lei Feng, um, who was a, a soldier in northeastern China, a rustless screw in the machine, um, who all who went around to the annoying do-gooder, and somehow there was always a photographer following him around doing really high quality professional photos in the 1960s when almost nobody had a camera in China at the time. And who wrote a diary, this guy was like three years of education, but it was written in really good Chinese. Um, and so, you know, if you were a somewhat critical, thoughtful person, you know, if you're in elementary school, you might go, oh, well, Leifeng is a really great guy. But later in life, you might reflect upon this and say, well, this is a bunch of hokum, really. And uh, one of my favorite uh, public intellectuals in China is this uh, thinker in Chengdu, Ren Yunfei, and he uh, met him once for, did a Q&A with him for the New York Review of Books, and he went on a diatribe against Lei Feng. How stupid does the government think we are to keep feeding us this decade after decade? Is this the best they can do? Uh, the, you know, the best sort of communist hero, this guy, of all people. Um, so the, but the government hasn't got rid of Lei Feng. If you, this is a propaganda sort of a poster thing, if you can see what point one. This is a little outline of Lei Feng. He's wearing one of these you know, hats in the winter. Eastern China. So you still see Lei Feng, model heroes, and model workers, and people like that in China. But the government began to push traditional values instead. Uh, traditional values again being defined as the values from the uh, Confucian, Taoist, Buddhist canon uh, that defined traditional thought 
in Asian China. Um, I won't go into this too much, but I got to know, and I wrote about in my book, a, a propagandist who used to be a diehard Maoist and wrote an opera about Mao and edited a journal uh, about Mao and was from Mao's home province of Hunan. And starting about 2011, I think he saw which way the wind was blowing and changed to becoming a big promoter of traditional values. And, you know, okay, not forget Mao, of course. We, the party hasn't forgotten Mao, but put the focus more on these more credible, time-tested ideas as a way of promoting uh, values and morality in China. Well, then I'm there, uh, looks like two members are about to be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, anyways, I don't want to go uh, This is a, a great propaganda campaign that he came up with, very talented person. He went to this area that makes uh, this workshop near Beijing that makes clay figurines. You see a little girl there on the middle shelf in the red. Um, he identified her, decided she would be the model for the China Dream campaign. And sure enough, if you've been to China in the past 10 years, you've definitely seen her because she was all over the place. He once posted to me, we're going to have a 60,000 kilometer campaign. I said, what would that mean? It's a 60,000. He said, there's 60,000 kilometers of highways in China. She's going to be plastered on all the way, every kilometer along. And for a while, I really thought I was going crazy because all you could see was this annoying girl dreaming the China dream with uh, slogans. Um, well, I'll tell you who it was. She knew she was at some point, and she was even in a for the gymnasium and so on and so forth. Yeah, these, these posters, which you now see, instead of, you know, those propaganda posters in China before were some red banners and white letters that say, you know, resolutely follow the parties, blah, 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 and I know it's going to be sad or uh, People just sort of uh, blanked it out. Now they use these kind of pleasing images from traditional culture, landscape paintings, chubby little girls like I just showed you, um, and saying slogans, uh, concepts from traditional China. Here's one in a park near <clears throat> where I live in Britain Park, which is promoting sort of traditional thought. Uh, one of the top uh, philosophers who uh, is supposedly, people tell me, uh, although Xi Jinping has not told me, Xi Jinping's favorite philosopher is this Neo-Confucian philosopher, Wang Yangming, um, who uh, was actually an interesting figure to have as your favorite philosopher because he was uh, a, a very typical upright Confucian official who spoke truth to power against the emperor and was banished then to the far reaches of the empire and Weizhou province from Beijing for speaking up against a corrupt eunuch, I think. And, uh, but uh, Xi Jinping likes him as a man of morality and a man of action. He was also a military leader, he was a can do person. So I went down to Guiyang, to the uh, area of the city in Guizhou, and they have an enormous Wang Yangming theme park. Uh, they have a Wang Yangming real estate project that's attached to it, so you can buy property and, and live near Wang Yangming's cave where he achieved and you know, meditated and came up with all those ideas. They even come up with a Wang Yangming robot. Um, this looks like Madame Tussaud, but it's, it's not Madame Tussaud because Wang Yang, this robotic Wang Yangming has facial recognition and software eyes. And so when you uh, meet him for the first time, he'll ask you, hello, what's your name? He'll say, my name is Father Lee. And the next time he sees you, he'll say, hello, Father Lee. Which uh, <laughs> I really think you have the first time. And not just, not just that, but his and they raised the extent calligraphy uh, from one of things. They programmed his arm to uh, manipulate a writing brush, and you can see there he can imitate Wang Yangming's calligraphy. Uh, not being much of a player for myself, I can't tell, but it looks pretty good. Uh, and this is a demonstration at a, a big sort of public event um, in uh, in Wayo. <clears throat> but they built it and are planning to build more into a bus. I don't know if they will or not, but this is a sort of ideas that people are coming up with to push traditional values, not just propaganda posters, but it's all kinds of uh, things. Um, especially, so I think I've been sort of dancing around this a little bit, but to be more specific, the government is explicitly supporting some religions. So 
Um, this would include folk religious practices like this. This is, looks like a guy just doing kung fu, but he's actually performing at a temple fair in Beijing, in the outskirts of Beijing. Um, how do they support groups like this? Um, well, one thing is groups like this in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were declared superstitious. They were banned. These religious groups were broken up. Uh, they, he's doing martial arts, but they perform for deities. They perform for folk religious deities, right? So he's not just doing martial arts for fun, he's doing it at a temple fair for a goddess. So this is to honor a goddess. This was all banned as superstitious in the, in the Nile era. In the 80s, 90s, 2000s, it was kind of tolerated and made a comeback as a grassroots uh, effort to revive these traditions among these working class people who did this. Starting 10 years ago, uh, this got explicit government support as intangible cultural heritage. Um, so this is borrowing a term from UNESCO, which refers to practices that are, so in other words, not concrete things like the Forbidden City or the Great Wall, but some practices like dance, music, rituals, pilgrimages, um, and there are currently over 10,000 officially recognized intangible cultural heritage uh, projects in China. And not all of them, by any means, are, are all religious, and they're not all religious. Um, but many of them do have a religious component. Because again, in traditional China, a lot of these practices had some kind of spiritual or faith element to them. So there's one group that I know very well that I wrote about in my book, Daoist and Taoist musicians, who are seen in the government's eyes simply as musicians. They're recognized as national level um, musicians. They get money from the government. Um, but, and then they do perform occasionally in concert areas. I, I took them abroad, I used to the Confucius Institutes. They perform you know, in, in museums and, and on stage and stuff like that. But 99% of what they do are at Taoist funerals and temple fairs and so on. They are, so it's similar maybe it's the analogous to Bach. I mean, you can, nowadays people might just say well, Bach is a classical composer, but really most, most of what Bach wrote was for church services. So um, this is this is similar uh, in the government's eyes. This is just folk culture. It's martial arts. But what are they doing? They're actually doing stuff in honor of the gods. So it's uh, it's clearly for these people. It's an intensely important spiritual religious activity. For the government, it's just promoting traditional culture. Um, and, and I think this is also a clever way, a clever thing that the government has done. Because there was a, a many of these things that were declared superstitious in the past. What were they going to do about that? Some people said, "Why don't we have a new religion, a sixth religion called folk religion?" And some, uh, but this would probably open a can of worms. If you allow a sixth religion, what about a seventh or an eighth religion? Why couldn't you make Judaism legal in China or Hinduism for foreigners who practice that? Why why can't they have their own place of worship? Um, so if the government instead just redefined this as culture, while understanding, of course, uh, when we talk to government officials, they understand that there's a, a spiritual component because they want to revive certain spiritual faith practices. But there I am as part of my participant observer role uh, for like, KCs and writing. Uh, trying to club a Taoist priest over the head. Uh, however, he's twenty years younger than I am. Um, so, uh, yeah, also temple construction uh, is really going through the roof. All of this stuff requires, requires government support. If you're rebuilding a temple or expanding a temple, you need government approval for uh, zoning and things like that. Um, and you uh, can't get this without, uh, without government support. The problems with foreign faiths. No, but, um, the foreign face, why are they called foreign face? Um, they aren't really foreign because here, specifically, I'm thinking of Islam and Christianity. Islam has been in China for over a thousand years. Christianity has had a permanent presence for over 400 years. Um, here I have a, from a Jesuit graveyard in Beijing, uh, tombstones, tombstones of uh, 
just to show that uh, Christianity has had a long, uh, long-term presence in China, um, the government is viewing these religions much more skeptically. Um, I want to just emphasize that because China is a huge country, uh, it's easy to sort of cherry pick always the most negative and distressing information. And that while what I, you know, what I will talk about are definitely problems in, in China for these states, by and large, the majority of people, especially Christians, still go through daily life and still worship without facing a lot of these problems. So this is just a church, uh, this is a pilgrimage that I uh, went on uh, outside of Taiyuan, uh, Our Lady of Seven Sorrows, uh, Mountain Cape Gully, um, and you know, these sort of things, I, I wrote about this um, uh, area for um, America Magazine, uh, which you can find an article online. Uh, and you know, people still, so they go on pilgrimage, they have, they still worship, and they have their photos taken in front of places like that. Uh, this was a, around the same time, coincidentally, when there was a wedding in the village. This is kind of a neat Catholic wedding where you see the picture, the, the people see, seated are the parents, and the bride and the groom are in the foreground with their backs to us. Um, and they're going to go kowtow to the parents, to one set of parents, and then the other parent, set of parents will switch out and they'll go down and kowtow again. This is kind of neat mixing of traditional uh, practices with. Uh, Catholic practices. Um, but there have been, at the same time, new regulations. And here I thought maybe just to uh, bullet point them really quickly, just to sort of um, maybe that helps emphasize them a little bit more. Um, this, these efforts, these new re regulations on religion parallel earlier efforts uh, against NGOs to achieve essentially the same goals. So the first one, banning foreign ties, foreign money is viewed very suspiciously, um, or, uh, and the idea that all religious organizations should be under government supervision. So this would include the underground churches uh, as well. Uh, and to, and this is all under the rubric, the last line there, of sinicizing. Uh, Chinese religions. This is a very uh, strange term in a way because they use this also about Taoism. How can you synthesize Taoism? It's already a Chinese religion, right? Uh, and, and Buddhism, and Xi Jinping already told us that Buddhism is already uh, synthesized. But basically, this means we go to tighter control. I thought it was kind of funny because many churches uh, have architecturally <laughs> synthesized decades ago. Uh, there's been this effort of, of how to fit into local culture, a source of conversation, they in church, for example, for decades or centuries. Um, so these, but this is not really what is meant. What, what's meant, I think, instead are how to rein in uh, churches like this. It's an underground church in Fujian province. This area of Sciences is 90% underground. And so I think the government's taken three uh, tactics toward these three different groups, Catholics, Protestants, and Muslims. For Catholics, it's been diplomacy in striking the deal with the Vatican and hoping that this will bring the underground church into the government fold. Um, now, it's kind of complex because uh, I think each side of these negotiations has different hopes and goals. Uh, but the overall idea from the government's point of view is that the underground church will be, become superfluous and it can become part of the government church. From the Vatican's point of view, it's a way to reinvigorate the uh, clergy in China by allowing more bishops to be consecrated um, and working through this backlog, uh, making the church more reactive to demographic changes. Um, so I think each side has their own goal, and we can maybe you'll have questions and I can go into this a little more in the Q&A. Um, but from the government's point of view, it's all part, I think, of the same strategy of trying to bring religion and more tightly under government control. Protestantism is a more problem, from the government's point of view, is a bit more problematic or, or 
troublesome because there is no hierarchy that unites all the Protestants. So the tactic there has been a shot across the bow um, for well-known uh, big uh, house churches, uh, basically ones that have been declared to be illegally uh, constructed have been demolished. Um, and in other cases, the um, more open expression of these churches, for example, uh, the uh, crosses on the, on, on the top of churches has been, this is in one particular province, but with a pretty vibrant Christian community, they've been taken down. It's this, this feeling that Christianity had become too kind of public, too visible um, in the city states of, 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 these, of this area. Um, so it's sort of a shot across the bow, a warning that these churches shouldn't get too big, shouldn't get too organized, and maybe you should try to register with the government. Um, toward Islam, I think the government has adopted the most draconian policy, which is a kind of forced, I don't have very good pictures of this because I just have some uh, stock pictures of Islam in China, but uh, I think you've probably read in the newspaper about re-education camps uh, for Muslims, a kind of forced secularization, this idea that many Muslims are conducting practices that are sort of too Muslim. They, uh, for example, uh, university students fasting during Ramadan has been banned. Some restaurants have been forced to sell uh, pork or alcohol. Uh, in some areas, women wearing hijabs are not allowed onto public transportation, and men with beards are not allowed onto public transportation. So this kind of, um, yeah, I would say almost like forced, and then of course the internment, internment camps have got the most, uh, this is a, a, a wire picture of one of these internment camps, uh, where up to a million Muslims in one particular province have gone through these camps, exact numbers are clear, uh, some people say a million are in the camp currently. I think it tends to be more than a million have gone through the camps. In, it, in any case, and what exactly they've learned there is also not clear. Uh, the government calls them uh, professional training centers, but I don't think there's any real evidence that they're learning any marketable skill there, except maybe to sing patriotic songs, read cheating things works, and shave their beards. Um, and they even had very credible reports of uh, party officials going to Muslims' homes and saying, you know, we don't want to really have that picture of Mecca on the wall, and take that off, and then say, hey, let's go in for a nice bowl of, of pork noodles, and if people are like, I don't think I'll have that, and they're, they'll say, well, you know, you've got an ideological problem, because if you want to fit into the mainstream, you have to accept mainstream ideas. So, Personally, I think this is an incredibly heavy-handed, counterproductive effort. Um, if there ever was a radicalization problem in China, in, in, in among Muslim communities, I think it's being made tenfold worse through these kind of policies. This is a, a protest, I think it was in Bangor, Istanbul, against the, um, uh, the, government, the Chinese government's policies toward leaders. The implication, I think, overall is that on a foreign policy level, it makes it hard, harder, perhaps, for China to push its foreign policy uh, Belt and Road Initiative into the Muslim world, uh, although currently we haven't seen any big uprising against Chinese policy, but it's a potential hindrance. This is a, a Facebook page of a church, a very well-known church in Chengdu. It got closed down. Uh, so we'll have, I think, if these House churches are closed down. Many of the people in the house churches are very well educated, very savvy, uh, and can continue to operate despite being banned. And I think this is also going to create more problems for the government going forward. Um, surveillance uh, of, 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 of religion is probably also increasing. Uh, and I think this is, in essence, I think toward the foreign faiths. Uh, using that sort of in quotation marks, Christianity and Islam, it creates, I think, problems for the government by uh, pushing people into a corner uh, that they, they probably don't want to necessarily be. Uh, toward other faiths, it's, a lot of this has been actually very welcome. So in my research among the folk religious communities, they think Xi Jinping is great. 
is he's supporting their work and they aren't really aware of any of these other problems. So, in summary, religion has been at the center of Chinese society, was a center of concern in the 19th century, an area of modern ideas in China thought had to be eradicated or really put down, was allowed to come back up, and now I think is again central in Chinese politics and foreign policy going forward into the future. Is there any uh, indications of the government influence or repression uh, in seminaries for women's uh, uh, organizations of sisters and so forth, the organization, the education, the promotion of leaders within these two groups of people from the Catholic point of view? Uh, well, I, I don't know specifically, but we assume that there are reports that people have to, I have this picture here of the flag being raised in a Buddhist temple, but those kind of things are happening in churches as well. Um, and the level of surveillance at a lot of churches um, is, is quite striking, and I think maybe that also, even if you don't say anything, have to say anything directly, I think people realize the state has a much stronger role. So, but I'm not sure in the curriculum, for example, of seminaries, uh, how that's changed. My name is Josh, I'm an OFM Franciscan friar, or between the Vatican and the Chinese government, just sort of open up that a little bit before that you were able to during your lecture. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I realize we're running out of time to sort of race over probably the most interesting thing to design, sorry. Um, yeah, well, uh, so the Accord is an effort, I, I think as, as maybe to back up, um, the number of Catholics in China since 1949 uh, has basically tracked population growth, going from 3 million in 1949 to roughly 10 million today. The um, outer figure would be 12 million, but there's pretty good survey work, for example, of the Holy Spirit Study Center in Hong Kong, uh, that, uh, you know, based on baptisms and so on, registers that the, the number of perhaps even peaked 10 years ago at 12 million, million and it's going down. So I think, again, I'm not, uh, I don't know the exact thinking of the Pope, for example, but if I were, in, in, having talked to some people, or some of them, just if I were putting myself in their shoes, I think this, this system is broken in, in China. The church is not, uh, this divided clergy is much more a problem for Catholics than for Protestants. The number of Protestants went from 1 million in 1949 to about 60, 50, 60 million today. And the numbers are sort of all over the place. There's no really solid demographic research in China uh, because these kind of opinion polls are not allowed. Uh, so it's very hard. You have to triangulate between different surveys and, and, and that sort of thing. But clearly, the strength of the church is its hierarchy, but it's also in an oppressive system like this, it's also a weakness. Um, so for many Catholics, uh, worshiping, if your bishop has been only approved by Beijing, has not been approved by the Vatican, and you may feel you cannot worship there. This is sort of one of the origin of the underground church. Uh, I think the hope is that going forward, that by having joint appointments of bishops, that people will feel comfortable to, that the bishops have been approved by the Vatican. Um, and that this will allow the, this will help reinvigorate the clergy. Uh, for example, I think that there's a huge demographic change going on in China that, uh, that she found around the world from uh, of urbanization. China used to be 80% rural, uh, now it's over 50% urban. Uh, many traditional Catholic communities, uh, village life, uh, these villages are emptying out, and you're just left with very old people and maybe children who have been sort of left behind. And the young people are move, moving to the cities. When they move into the cities, the churches are not always there to keep them in the fold, and they just stop practicing their faith. Uh, perhaps the hope is that by having a more uh, functional clergy, a younger clergy, one that isn't as age, aging as badly, that you can then make the church more vital. That's, I think, the Vatican's hope. But I don't think that that's clearly, of course, not the government's hope. The government doesn't want to reinvigorate Catholicism. 
the company, right, obviously, uh, the government wants to bring these people under also Beijing approved uh, bishops. Uh, and then they think that that will somehow uh, make re religious life more easily controlled. So how this will work in the future, whether there, there have been two bishops who have been approved jointly, seem to have gone smoothly, um, if that can continue in the future, there's a backlog of bishops who need to be consecrated. Uh, if that can go f smoothly forward, then it could be successful. Uh, but I think it really takes time for these things to work out. There's, it's always, in, you know, China is also the land of soft openings. These things are announced, and then there's sort of implementing re regulations, and then there's a trial period, and it always goes really slowly before you can see the effect. So just looking at something and then making a snap decision, like this is selling out to the communists, uh, which some people have said, that's an easy call to make. Right? That's not sort of easy to say, oh, you can't deal with the communists, they're not trustworthy, that's a sell-up. Um, but I would say, look, it's, my personal feeling is it's worth trying, uh, because the old system was broken. If it doesn't work, you're no worse off. You can always just uh, scrap it and go back to the way it was before. Uh, so. That's, yeah, that's my own take. But I think other people in this room may have more support. Yes, I have a question. Hi, uh, I'm Jean. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, uh, for tonight's presentation. Very informative. Well, uh, uh, I am uh, a Christian and I grew up in China. I covered opposite to you. I left China in 1992. I went to Rwanda. Arabic country, Muslim country, all the way to the west, the very whole west. Uh, so I've seen a lot of changes uh, in and out of the box. But my question here, too, uh, one is, uh, what do you think of the Hong Kong protest and the Catholic Hong Kong uh, Association organization uh, playing a role for Hong Kong, the current Hong Kong? And second uh, question is, in the west, what do you expect the people in the West to do? Thank you. Okay, uh, as well, in terms of the Hong Kong protests, uh, yeah, it's been well documented that religious organizations, especially Christian, Christian groups, have played a role or have helped inspire people to action. Uh, I think that's important, but I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of the protests are just middle class and uh, frustration or fear that something that they have is, is going to be lost, uh, especially say rule of law or an independent judiciary. So I think the religious groups might help organize a little bit or help inspire people to action, but I don't think it's primarily a religious based uh, uh, movement. Um, in terms of what people can do, well, I, you know, you can, Go to the bottom line of the U.S. China Catholic Association, $2,500 and above. <laughs> <laughs> I know that what you can do is, uh, I think engagement still helps, personal engagement, uh, talking to people, traveling, uh, meeting people, uh, showing that you care. There's nothing, I don't think if you write a letter to the Chinese consulate or embassy, I don't think it's going to matter that much. I think, though, that some, uh, if, if there are people that you care about who have been detained or sent to a labor camp uh, being active in a human rights uh, group helps, or an organization like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International can help. But I think uh, being somehow engaged with China is probably the best way. Uh, you mentioned that uh, two bishops have been uh, consecrated since the uh, uh, provisional uh, agreement with the Vatican. Uh, were they uh, uh, public or underground? And is there any sense that the underground is accepting this in any way at all? Yeah, I, um, I think it's in terms of how the underground church is accepting it. Um, I, when I was in Fujian, in, in this uh, diocese I mentioned, um, the underground bishop said he would accept it. Um, 
kind of grudgingly, but he said he would accept the deal and he would make way for the other bishop. Uh, I think it's going to take some time because many of the underground, much of the so much, or a large percentage of the underground church is very sort of clannish based. I mean, people have always been in the underground church. And I think they will have, uh, might have a hard time quickly accepting it. And I think this is something, this is a process that, if it works, is going to be something that plays out over years and years, and maybe even decades. Um, but I, so I think it'll, I haven't been to these places, so I don't know. I'm not sure whether people in those areas accept it or not. But having been to other parts where there's an underground church, that's my sense is that. Uh, it's going to take quite a while to convince people. Hello, my name is Ben. Thank you for your presentation. How would you describe the relationship between churches in Hong Kong and the churches in mainland China and what support they offer to each other? Uh, well, you know, there is quite close uh, support or, or contact between the Hong Kong and the mainland churches. Uh, this is, I think from the government's point of view, somewhat problematic, even though Hong Kong is part of China, um, it's still viewed uh, as sort of outside of China, you know, right? and they don't like to have too much foreign, or any sort of foreign support uh, for church. But I think inevitably, you do see support. Uh, but concretely, I'm not too sure. Hello, I'm not sure you think that the it's a question of rewriting the Bible and children not being allowed to go to church. Um, there, I think we have to be really careful because there are these, there are a, a lot of reports out there, and there's a cottage industry kind of in uh, fear mongering about uh, religious persecution in China. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be so. So, but there are some, you know, websites um, and that I think are completely unreliable, um, like Bitter Winter, which pushes a lot of these uh, stories that are just very anecdotal or completely torqued in a way that is not uh, accurate. Like this thing that children cannot go to church, you know, because China is such a huge place, it's very hard to know really what's going on. But I think many churches recently where children are there. I don't, I can't, and it could be that there are some areas where local officials think religion is really too powerful here, we need to do something about it, uh, that children might be discouraged from going. Right? So I, I wouldn't rule it out, but to say this is across the board the case, I really, really doubt that. Um, in rewriting the Bible, I think there's uh, efforts to, this predates a lot of this, and I don't know if I'm not, I think you have to look at it more from a philological point of view to see how what the new Bibles are like. Uh, but I, I think people, if believers don't like the new Bibles, and they simply won't use it to drive people into the underground church. I'm wondering if there is any advocacy among Chinese Christians on behalf of the leaders. Okay. Well, a, a, a Beijing specific question. Over the, the past year, the closure of three major Protestant churches, uh, Shalom, uh, Zion, and uh, Early Rain. And to what extent is that like a sign of things to come, or is there something idiosyncratic about, about each one? Okay. And then um, the, the common posture of the American church towards one another, Catholic, Orthodox, and the thousands of Protestant denominations, is one of either active hostility or passive uh, competition. I'm wondering if that exists in China as well. Just right. the posture of the different churches and denominations, one towards another, if there's collaboration, right. hostility, or competition. Okay, okay. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I think those two questions are kind of related in that there's almost no way to take dialogue in China. Uh, people, there's also almost no presence of religion in the media, um, or, so when, when there's big national issues, uh, religious leaders are almost never interviewed 
or talk, or talk to each other. The only time you see religious leaders together is when there's some sort of token event, like a massive mudslide, and then the leaders of the five groups get together and hold up, you know, a big check and say, oh, the Taoist Association is donating five million yuan, the Buddhist Association, the Catholics are going to, is they also get together for a photo op, and that's it. You never see any sort of uh, discussions. It's, so I think it's the same with the Uyghur. I mean, first of all, most people don't even really know what was going on in Xinjiang. And probably a lot of people uh, have talked to support it. They say, oh, Muslims are all radical, we have to, you know, secularize them. It's our job as, as Han Chinese to bring the benefits of modernization and rapid industrial growth to all the minority groups in China. Uh, so that's sort of their view toward that. In terms of those three big, uh, well-known Protestant churches, uh, yes and no. Though they were, I think the government is shot across the bow is to tell the big churches if you're running a seminary, underground churches, if you're running a seminary, if you set up a national network, if you are running even elementary schools, which uh, at least one of these churches was doing, that's completely not acceptable. If you're big, large scale, if you purchase property, that's really not acceptable, I think, anymore. Uh, or will become increasingly less. If it's just really, you know, 15 or 20 people meeting in someone's living room quietly for purely, for pure, just for service, there's no social component or no organizational structure, that's probably still going to be a lot. But I think the, so it's a sign of things to come in the sense that the government wants house churches to go back to being house churches and not being big organized churches. But I think those three churches were also, because they were the leading lights in the house church movement, that's why they were immediately uh, closed.